Mark that there. Okay, well, let's stand as we look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We'll be reading from verses uh, 7 uh, through 18. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 7 to 18. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of that light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. Uh, but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. On account of this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Please be seated. Um, I would often remind our children, because uh, when I was growing up, uh, I, we didn't have much. Okay, uh, our family was very, very poor. This was before John was born, uh, and and um, you know, without getting into all the details, it was just really, really. I mean, I didn't think it was that hard, but as I look back, uh, we did not have, you know, pretty much anything. You know, like today when I see our children, uh, you know, going biking and playing Fortnite, you know, and, and you know, going, going to like homeschool events and, you know, house, I mean, those play dates with other children and going to parks and, you know, on a weekly basis, you know, going to like uh, McDonald's or Chuck E. Cheese or whatnot. Um uh, it's so different as I'm growing up and all the stuff that I didn't get and they all have and not realizing what it's like to not have it. So I would always tell them, you know, guys, before you eat lunch right now, just, just imagine if mommy was not here. You know, right now, just think if mommy was, if dad was not here and I kind of see who, which face, which, which person they'll get more like, you know, shocked, you know, uh, 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 sad about. Uh, what if we didn't have a home? Instead, we had like a small apartment, you know, where eight of us, you know, is in a one bedroom home. Um, you know, what if we didn't have bicycles? What if we, we didn't have this church? You know, and I would keep reminding them that you need to be thankful for like everything. And all of us are blessed uh, today with jobs. We all have cars. Okay. We all have food and clothing. We have each other. We have Christ residing in our heart, the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. Okay, And so we forget that. And we have to remember that. But with the blessings that God has given to us, we also have a responsibility. He, he's not just giving it to us to enjoy. He's giving it to us also to have a responsibility of walking worthy. And that's what Ephesians 4 through chapter 6 is all about. Look at chapter 4 verse 1 again. Paul says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, exhort you to walk in a, in a worthy manner, to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Walk worthy. Why? Because you're so blessed. Walk in such a way that it always expresses how much blessings you have received and let your life be of equal amount. And that's what the word worth means. Your way of living must be worth of equal amount of the blessings of God in your life. And one of the ways to, to remind yourself to do that is to just to keep telling yourself, what if I didn't have it? What would life be like if this was not given to me? Now, in terms of the specifics, Paul lays out clear, clear instructions. Your responsibility with all the blessings you have is number one, Keep the unity in the church strong. 
He says, verse 2, With all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, be diligent to keep the what? Unity. To keep the unity. Do whatever you have to do. Meaning, if you want to be worthy of God, your worthiness of God is revealed as you eagerly maintain the unity of His body. You're diligent. And then the rest are specific ways of doing that. And we come to verse 17. From verse 17 to verse, uh, verse 17 in chapter 5, all the way to chapter 6, we have this practice, the clear practice of walking worthy. We walk worthy, number one, with a new mindset. Verse 17 to 19. We walk worthy with a new lifestyle, verses 22 to 31. And number three, we are to walk worthy with a new attitude. And that's what we see in chapter 5, verses 1 through 21. We need to have an attitude of love, an attitude of purity, an attitude of separation. And today, okay, I'm sorry, with an attitude of separation, we started that last, last Friday. Separate in several ways. We're separate in adoption, separate in character, and today we're going to look at two more, separate in purpose and separate in activity. Okay, So this new attitude that God requires of us is love, purity, and what? Separation. And as, and as I told you last week, we're learning separation in, on Sundays with Acts chapter 2. We're learning separation on last Friday and today. That means he is providentially setting three messages all about that one word. Because he wants the church to be absolutely what? Separate. The church is not to be like the world. The church is not to mesh with the world or tolerate the world. The church is... In all of our attitude and our behavior, we're to be separate. We're to be separate because of our adoption. That's in verse 8. It says, You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children, children who've been adopted. We have to be separate in character. Verse 9, The fruit of light consists in goodness, righteousness, and what? Truth. What's goodness? Goodness means you think more of others first. Righteous, it means that you are upright and fair. What's truth? It means you're no longer lying. So you're separate in, a, in being adopted. You're separate in your character. And thirdly, we are to be separate because of a different purpose. Look at verse 10. We're, we're separate from the world because we're different in our purpose. What is this purpose? Look at verse 10. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, okay? Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. This is our purpose in life. Every single day, our goal in life is to figure out what pleases our Lord, okay? If you're sitting here thinking, what is the purpose of my life? What, is, what has God planned for me? We'll give it to you is to try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. The phrase trying to learn, it's the same word in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And we'll look at that in a, in a second. But the word, the Greek word is dokimazo. It means to make a critical examination of something, to put it to test, to examine. Okay? And the grammatical parsing is that it is a present active participle. Those of you who know English, it just simply means it's a continual thing that never what? Ends. It's present tense. It's happening right now. It's active and it's a participle with an ing. You are continually doing this. Meaning, for the rest of our life, we're trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. If you want to have a motto in life, like, you know, some people say, this is my life verse. Let it be verse 10. Wear a shirt trying to learn what is pleasing to the what? Lord, that should be our next church shirt or sweater. Okay? It is our, it is our eager purpose to examine ourselves critically. 
always asking, am I living in a way that is pleasing to the Lord? The word pleasing is a Greek word you all, you, you all rest on. It means acceptable. Acceptable. Okay? God deems what you have just done as accepting of, acceptable to Him. Meaning, it implies the opposite. There are things that God will what? Find unacceptable. We read that in Mark 10. When the disciples prevented the children from coming to Him, He was indignant against the disciples. He said, I will not have that. I will not accept what you're doing. So the Lord either accepts what you're doing and rejects what you're doing. Turn with me to Romans 12. And this is where the same word is used. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You should, you should know this. It's a verse that you've memorized uh, for your memory verses. It's under the heading obedience to Christ, right? It says, verse 1, Therefore I exhort you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and what? Pleasing. Some of your versions will say acceptable, the NASB. So it's both. It's so pleasing to God, He will receive it unto Himself. And He says that this, if it's pleasing, it is a spiritual service of what? Worship. It's not like singing in the church that you're trying to give to God. It's your life, the way you are living. That is deemed as worship. And look at verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may approve. That word approve is the same word that we saw, dokimazo, to make critical examination. So that you may approve. You may critically look at your life and realize Hey, this is the will of God. Do you know what this means? It's not that we're wondering if God received it. It's not like, oh, when I die, I'll figure out if He accepted it or what. Not. That's what a lot of Catholics will say, right? I don't know if what I did was okay, but you know, when I die, you know. It's saying, if you transform your mind, you renew your mind, your life is transformed, you can actually see and critically discern if you are walking in a way that's acceptable or not. You can approve that. That's what Paul is saying. We're not in the dark about this. You understand? The more you know the scripture, the more you study the scripture, the more you are able to say, oh, what I did is pleasing or not what? Pleasing to God. And again, he uses the word, you are on again, that which is good, that which is pleasing, and that which is what? Perfect. The word pleasing there is that word for him receiving it. What does this mean? Okay. Being biblical means you can discern with the principles of Scripture the appropriate action and behavior for that moment. Now, this is different okay, than being like legalistically obedient to the law. Does that make sense? You know, I didn't steal, so I must be pleasing to God today. Yeah, people are blindly living their life. They want to stick to just generic laws. I kept the law. I stopped at the stop sign. I did this. I didn't steal. I paid my taxes. And they think, oh, I'm totally fine. We're not talking about those. We're talking about your daily lifestyle. Okay? It's about at that moment, was my attitude, was my process of thinking, was my mindset pleasing to God? And you know, if you turn with me to Romans 14, and I've referred to this, referred to this passage many, many times. Um, in Romans 14, um, he gives this example about two types of immature Christians in the church. One group of Christians have a very strong conscience. They, and they, they know a lot of Bible. 
and they were able to go to the marketplace and buy meat at that time. That meat which was sacrificed to another idol or demon. So people would do that at a temple. All this precious meat was still there. They would sell it to the marketplace. The marketplace would use that and sell it to the what? People. It's fresh meat. And it was much cheaper too because it was used at the temple places. So when they became Christians, some Christians said, I will never eat that meat ever again. It was touched by a demon. So one group of immature Christians could not buy the meat. The other group of Christians in the same church said, you know what? It's nothing. It's nothing. It's not going to hurt us. It's not going to make, you know, make us you know, demon-possessed. And so Paul tells both groups of people in the church and says, both of you are acting very, very what? Immaturely. And look what he says here in chapter 14, verse uh, 15. It says, For if because of food your brother is grieved, you are no longer walking according to what? Love. Do you guys see that? If you look at verse 13, do you see where it says, Therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather judge this? It's a play on words, and you don't see it in English, but it's literally saying this, Let us not judge down on another anymore, but if you want to judge them, Judge how not to put a stumbling block in their path. Because the more knowledgeable Christians were condemning the younger ones and saying, you guys are so foolish. You're, you're just so ignorant of all the Bible verses we know. And then they would go off and buy the what? Meat without caring what the other Christian was what? Feeling. And so Paul is saying, hey, if your brother is grieved, because you wanted to eat that meat, you're no longer, the phrase says walking according to love, but if you connect it back to Romans 12, what is he saying? The way you're living is not acceptable to what? God. Do you, do you see that? It's not acceptable. You might in your clear conscience be eating the meat and enjoying the meat, and biblically, is there anything wrong with eating that meat? Biblically, no. But is God going to receive that act from you? And the answer is absolutely what? Not. Because look what he says here. Do not destroy with your food. Now, this is really kind of like sarcastic. You're going to destroy your brother because of a piece of food. Okay? For him, for whom Christ died. He's saying, what's more important, that meat or the person that Jesus died for? And it's obvious what the answer is. So look at what he says in verse 16. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing. You know that meat? For you it's a good thing. Do not let that be slander. Now this is really interesting. What he's saying here is, don't let... The word slander is the Greek word blasphemeo, where we get the word blaspheme. He, or, the word blaspheme, lexically, it means to speak in a disrespectful way that demeans, denigrates, maligns, and defames. Satan is called a blasphemer. He's always accusing. So what he's saying is this. If you go out and buy that meat, which is a good thing, but the younger Christian blasphemes your activity, now that activity now is, be, is going to always be considered to be, to him, very, very what? Sinful. Like, can you imagine if somebody in the church said, mountain biking is of the devil? Right, Luis? What would you do, my brother? <laughs> he is our chief shredder, okay? The cheddar shredder. What will you do? Just, you just, you, it's just a bike. We're enjoying nature. And they're like, no, you're not. You could be reading the Bible, then pedaling uphill and down what? What are you going to say to that, right? And what do we have to do? Keep biking? No, because if we keep doing it, now it's blasphemous in that person's what? Mine will never be able to bike ever what? Again. <laughs> so look at what this says here. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be what? Slandered, meaning stop it for a moment. 
For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking or mountain biking or shredding for that matter, but it's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And look what it says in verse 18. For he who in this way, do you guys see that? In this way serves Christ is pleasing to God and approved by what? Men. Meaning, if he's telling the older Christians, if you can just put that, you know, meat aside just for a moment, so that that activity is not blasphemed, and you give time for the young believer to grow, and later on they can say that, yes, we will go biking with you, you know, with clear conscience. If you in that way serve Christ, you are pleasing to God. Notice, it's not a legal issue, isn't it? It's not a biblical, like, thou shalt not do this. It's a neutral activity. Paul even said, every food is actually clean. Um, if you look at verse 20, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. Now, you know, he, it looks like he's rebuking the more mature believer, the conscience, strong conscience believers, but you'll, he, he flips it around and he starts rebuking those who are younger. Look what he says. All things indeed are what? Clean. He's jabbing both sides here. He says, guys, don't destroy the younger believer because you want to do this. And then he flips it over to the younger Christian and says, look, everything, even that meat sacrificed to an idol is actually what? It's clean. There's nothing wrong with that meat. But they're evil for the man who eats and gives what? Offense. So he's kind of blaming them and saying, well, it's only for you guys, not for anyone else. And he's sort of rebuking them subtly. But at the end of the day, verse 21, it is not good, it is not, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything by which your brother, what? Stumbles. Okay? So, Paul is saying, this is our purpose in life. Okay? And this is just one example. But the idea is, as a Christian, we have to know when something is pleasing to God and when something is not what? Pleasing to God. Like think about today, just for today for a moment. From the morning you woke up to right now, look through the day. Were there things that were displeasing to God? Or can you say with a clear conscience, from the moment I woke up to all the way to right now, it was pleasing and acceptable to God? But how about this? Rather than right now looking back, did you take time to think about that throughout the what? Throughout the day. You guys know what I'm saying? You don't wait till the day's over and look back because it's too late. The idea is you're always trying to find what is pleasing to the Lord. It's a daily routine for you now. It's part of your life. Everything about you, you the way when you woke up, all right, my purpose is to figure out what is pleasing to what? God. And that is the new attitude of walking worthy. This is your responsibility. Fourthly, so we have, we're separate in adoption, separate in character, separate in purpose. And fourthly, within this idea of attitude of separation, we're, we're to be separate in activity. Okay, separate in activity. Again, we've heard this twice already. But look at verse 11. Do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. Do not participate. The word is very familiar. Listen carefully. Sug koinoneo. You guys remember that word koinoneo? Fellowship. Koinonia. Okay. Fellowship. Soon, the, the prefix means fellowshipping with. We're in fellowship and communion with each other. What he's saying is no longer be in fellowship with darkness. Do not be associated with someone in some activity to be connected to, to be sympathetically interested in that activity. 
Everything about a, a Christian is that you are separate and people around you need to know this. Paul is telling the Ephesians that as Christians, there are certain things Christians must not participate in. Meaning, you're known for what you do, right? You do good. You do what's right. You do what's honorable. But you also have to be known in the negative. When someone thinks about your name and who you are, they know, oh, that person just won't do this. Look at Psalm 1 for a moment, okay? We're going to call this the negative Christian. A Christian is not just positively good, he's also negatively good. Look at Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is the, um, it's not the first psalm that King David wrote. When they were compiling the psalms, the man who compiled this read this and said, you know what, this is going to be first. This is the psalm. This is the psalm that in, will introduce all 150 psalms. Okay? So it's so important to understand why they put this here under the inspiration of God. Look at how verse 1 opens up and just ask yourself how negative verse 1 is. How blessed is the man who does not walk. Negative. Negative. He doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. He does not stand in the way of sinners. He does not sit. Do you guys see that? Three negatives. He doesn't walk. He doesn't stand. He doesn't what? Sit. Now some commentaries that you read will, will say like this. Oh, this is about progressively getting closer to sin. So once you're walking with sin, now you're sitting with sin. I'm standing with sin, now you're sitting. I don't buy that. I think what he's just saying here is that you are to be completely away from what? Sin. Not even close to it, not even walking, not even standing. You're, you're, you're a man. You're blessed of God. You're known for what you don't do. You're not even close to it. You're not going to walk in it. You're not going to stand in it. You're not going to what? Sit. It's all negatives. A man of God is known for what he just will not do. What about the positive? Well, there's only one. Look at verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law He meditates day and night. How many of you guys can say, I really delight in the law of God? Or you just want to read it. You just want to read it. You delight in His word. You wish you had more time. And think about how many things you actually delight in. Whatever that might be. Paul is saying a Christian is someone who separates himself from the activities of darkness. You should be known as someone who just won't do that and just won't participate in that. Whatever the case, when someone mentions your name and they think of you, immediately negative things occur in their mind. Oh, that person won't do that. That person won't do that. That person, we try to get them to do this with us. Just won't do it. Just won't do it. That is to be your attitude. I must be separate. And by the way, this command to be separate, it's very, very strong. And let me prove it to you like this. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. There's, we're going to argue this from the lesser to the greater, or actually no, greater to even more greater, okay? Because if you take a look at chapter 5, he's telling the church to be separate from a professing Christian. He's not even talking about those in darkness. He's not talking about the, the world. If you look at chapter 5, verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my letter, not to associate with, with those who are sexually immoral. Okay? The word associate there means to mingle socially. And, and Paul makes, he's, he's making it clear, verse 10, he goes, hey, I'm not talking about the world, the, 
the sexually immoral people of this world or those who are greedy or swindlers or with idolaters. For then, if you have to separate yourself, you will literally have to go out of this world. Now, do you see the intensity of that word? He's saying, if there's a Christian in the church who is sinning and will not repent, don't even get close to that guy. Don't even eat with him. You literally have to separate from that Christian who won't repent. Because, and then he says, let me show you what I mean. I mean literally, do not even come close. Because he says, if I meant the world, it would mean you have to leave the what? Leave the world. Do you guys see the intensity of this word now? When Paul says, be separate from the world, the Bible or God is telling you, do not participate. Look at 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 3. Again, again this is to a, another believer. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul says, Now we command you. This is apostolic command. Equivalent to Jesus giving us his command. We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who walks in an unruly manner and not according to the tradition in which they receive from God us and look at verse 14 if anyone does not obey our word in this letter take special note of that person to not associate with him so that he will be put to shame it is severe right it is severe because this is what other churches will say to me if someone is sinning, right, and they're lost in sin and they're living a life that's not right and they're, and, you know, they're just, you know, marriage is breaking up, their family's breaking up and, and they're just in the pit of life, right? Isn't it more better to continually keep the what? Relationship going. Practically, isn't that better pragmatically, Right? Don't you have to be there for them? Don't you have to keep encouraging them? And the answer is, the Bible does not say that. Isn't that interesting? Humanistically, we might think that's the way to go, right? Someone is, you know, struggling in sin, and we've confronted them, they've tried, they're struggling again. They keep saying, I'm struggling, but you tell them you have to stop, and they don't stop. What do you have to do? You have to literally cut everything and separate yourself from them. See, humanistically, it doesn't make sense. But God is saying that's the right thing to do because that's what He deemed as holy. Now, I can come up with many, many reasons why that, in God's eyes, is better to separate yourself from them. But I'm not going to give those to you because a command is simply a what? A command. Does that make sense? You can't be like, well, okay, why did God say that? I wonder why. What's your reason? Okay, oh, oh, I see. Now I'll obey. Guys, if you have that kind of an attitude, it's more of a rebellious heart. That you won't simply submit and trust God. You would rather have Him explain to you why you should do what you do. But I'll give you one. One reason is this, and it's, it's found in, in Galatians. Okay? When you try to help someone in their sin, if they don't repent, you might be tempted to commit that what? Sin, and now you will be lost in what? Sin, and God would rather have you preserved from what? From sin. In that sense, let no, none of you ever think that I'm immune and I could help anyone with whatever sin they're committing. You know, so-and-so struggling with pornography. Oh, I'm going to help them. No, you're not. Because you're tempted to. Do you understand? You can't be so confident that, oh, I'm going to help that person out with their sin and I'm going to give them all my time. I'm going to... No. That's one reason why God doesn't want us to associate with that person because 
we are people prone to imitate other what? Other people. We, that's why the church is to be filled with people who are repenting. If, there's, if someone is sinning, God says, cut them out because they're like a disease. It will start spreading to the rest of the what? Rest of the people. But again, going back to this idea of how strong this word is, if he's going to say this to a fellow Christian, how much more, right, in terms of not participating in the unfruitful works of what? Of darkness. Turn back to Ephesians now. And let's take a look at that word unfruitful. The unfruitful works of darkness. The word unfruitful is literally a karpos. Okay? Karpos means fruit, literal fruit. The alpha privative in the, in the front negates that and says no fruit. And aside from the actual fruit, the, the plant, the plant, you know, the, the vegeta- it's not a vegetable. Okay, it's a plant life, okay? Aside from that, it was used as a metaphor for producing something useful, productive, lasting, profitable. These are the lexical definitions. So unfruitful is the very opposite. It is unproductive, it's useless, it's earthly, temporal, it's demonic. Anything of this world literally has no fruitfulness. It is absolutely useless. There's nothing that will benefit you by participating in the unfruitful works of darkness. Meaning, by principle, nothing good comes out of an activity of sin. Nothing. Did you know that there are churches today that are teaching that if you're struggling with this temptation, given just a little, then it'll be better. What is that? They say, well, you know, if, this, if the, whatever sin you're committing is that big, just do a little bit and you'll overcome. You'll actually feel much better. It is so bad. It is so heretical to say that. Sin is absolutely unfruitful and you, you are going to extinguish the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life because you want to participate in that unfruitful works of darkness. And what this means is this. Your life is meant to bear fruit. Okay, Turn with me to John 15. <clears throat> John 15. Your life is meant to bear fruit. And when you bear fruit, it gives God glory. Look at John 15 verse 1. And we're going to read to verse 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine, is the vine grower. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. <coughs> and He's referring to hell. And every branch that bears fruit, He cleans it so that it may bear more what? More fruit. Do you guys see that? You bear a little fruit, He's going to make you bear more what? Fruit, what that means is your life is meant to keep producing more and more and more what? Fruits. It is to be useful. That's what He's saying. God can use you in so many ways. He says, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit from itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. He's saying, This is your responsibility. Stop participating in the fruits, I mean, in the unfruitful works of darkness. Start abiding in me. And this refers to. All kinds of abiding, abiding in prayer, abiding in reading His Word, abiding in fellowship, abiding in all that's godly. You're constantly remaining with Christ on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis. He says, apart from me, you cannot do anything. Keep remaining in me because you are one with Him and at the same time you have to keep trying to be what? With Him on a practical day-to-day level. 
Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branch. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse eight, verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Do you notice he's saying you either are bearing fruit or you're not? There's no middle ground. If you bear fruit, you'll bear more fruit. If you don't bear fruit, you'll be cut and thrown into what? Hell. Everyone in hell is there because they are absolutely useless. And look at verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. What he's saying there is, if you are in me and abiding in me and you're studying my word and you need things to grow and bear fruit, pray, I'll give it to you. That's what he's saying. You really want to bear fruit? Ask and I'll give it to you. You need a wife to grow and bear fruit? I'll give it to you. You need a husband? I'll give it to you. You need a job? I'll give it to you if your intent and purpose is to bear more what? Bear more fruit. Whatever you need. You need a car? I'll give it to you. When the heart is set on bearing fruit for God, He gives you everything that you possibly need. But if you're out to do it for yourself, because you want your own self-esteem for your life? He's not. And look at verse 8. And, and, and this is sort of the reason for verse 7. Meaning, Jesus says, I will give you everything you need to grow and bear fruit. Why? Because my Father, verse 8, is glorified by this. Isn't that amazing? So here's Christ who desires to bless you with anything you ask for. Not so that you would be blessed, but that as you bear fruit, it gives glory to what? Jesus' his Father. Isn't that amazing? Meaning, Jesus' his concern is not even of himself, it's to bring glory to the Father. And if any one of you want to bring glory to God the Father, Jesus said, I'll be there with you. I'll strengthen you, bless you, give you whatever you need. Just abide in me. I will empower you. I will give you whatever. And chapter 16 is all about the Spirit of God. Why is the Holy Spirit residing in us? It is to make us empowered by Him to be fruitful, to bring glory to God. Verse 8 again. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. How does this whole thing start? If you cut off, you're burned, you're not his disciple. If you bear fruit and you bear more fruit, you prove to be his what? His disciples. One of the most clearest assurances of salvation that you can have, that you are actually his child, is the fruitfulness of your life. When you're not bearing fruit, when you don't see God using you, you're going to start doubting whether or not you're saved. That makes sense, right? Fruitfulness is the passing test of our union with Christ. So to prove ourselves to be His disciples, we have to be fruitful. Now you might be asking, well, what is this fruit? It can refer to any spiritual consequence. You have the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of those virtues. You have the fruit of your ministry. People are blessed by what you do. They grow by what you do. They, they, they are edified by who you are. People are coming to Christ through you, directly or indirectly. Children are learning from you. There are people who look up to you and they follow you and they obey you. You're ministering and it's being effective. And parenting becomes the biggest test of true maturity because now your children want to obey Christ because they see that in you. It's really sad when you see parents 
giving up on child raising, saying things like this. Oh, you know what? If God's going to save them, He's going to save them. I'm powerless to do anything. I don't think they understand what they're saying. Bear fruit. Bear much fruit. How? You got to separate yourself from the sinful activity because the unfruitful works of darkness is just that. It is absolutely useless. It does not bear fruit. And look at what it says. Let's go back to Ephesians. It says, verse 10, Do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. What does that mean? Well, it, the word expose is a, is a command, a, an imperative. Okay? It means to bring to light, expose. It could also mean to rebuke, to reprove, to correct, to even punish or even discipline. MacArthur says this, the verb here translated exposed from the Greek word eleko can also carry the idea of reproof, correction, punishment, or discipline. We are to confront sin with intolerance. We are never to excuse any works of darkness, whatever that might be. He says we need to expose sin for what it is, that it is sinful. Our responsibility is to call that which is sin, sinful. The opposite is to remain silent, okay? which is wrong. Because here, Paul is saying, speak up. If you see a sinful activity, you must speak up. Now again, we're not talking about to the world. We're talking about the fellow believers. If your fellow believer in the church, a church member, is doing something that's sinful, absolutely sinful, Okay, when I say absolute sinful, I'm not talking about like it's so sinful. It's, it's simply sin as opposed to, you know, you remember last week we said if you don't think it's sin and it's, you know, they, they kind of, their, their personality doesn't match with you and it kind of, you know, offends you because you're just overly sensitive. That's not sin. That's your fault. If it's sin, you are to call it out and say it is sin. We're not to be silent. Okay. MacArthur says this, and I quote, Often, of course, open rebuke is necessary. Silent testimony will only go so far. Failure to speak out against and to practically oppose evil is a failure to obey God. Believers are to expose them in whatever legitimate biblical ways are necessary. Love that, own, love that does not openly expose and oppose sin is not biblical love. You should know all the references about exposing sin. Matthew 18, verse 15. Now, if your brother sins, go and show him his what? His fault. 1 Timothy 5, 1. Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather plead with him. Notice, don't rebuke an old person in a very condescending way, but still go and what? Talk to him. Do you see that? It's always Con confrontation. You must confront if you see sin. 1 Timothy 5.20 Those who continue in sin reprove in the presence of all so that all will be rest uh, so, that, so that the rest will also be fearful. 2 Timothy 4.2 Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and teaching. Titus 1.13, this testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely. It's not about the Cretes who are known to be lazy, so that they may be sound in the faith. Titus 2.15, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Now, if you look at verse 12, it's kind of interesting because 11 says, Speak, and then look at verse 12. For it is disgraceful even to what? <laughs> Speak. So what's going on? Verse 11 says, say it out loud. And then it says in verse 12, 
Don't say it out loud. It is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in what? Secret. Now it sounds like a paradox, but I think you get the idea. Just call it sin. You don't have to get into detail and go into the, the stuff where it will cause everybody to stumble. Meaning don't go into any unnecessary detail about the sin because it's disgraceful. The word disgraceful, it means it's ugly, it's base, it's a moral deformity, it's socially, morally unacceptable, it's shameful. If it's sin, just call it sin. If it's adultery, just call it adultery. You don't have to go into all the what and this and what and this, all the, you know, it's just, if it's sin, it's just sin. There's no need to talk about the sin itself because it is disgraceful even to what? Speak of the things which are done by them in secret. You know what that means? In the church, there are some things we shouldn't even just, we should not talk about it. Just call it sin. Use biblical terminology. And I understand MacArthur when he says this. He says some books and articles written by Christians on various moral issues are so explicit that they almost do as much to spread the problem as to cure the what? The problem. And whenever you counsel somebody um, about whatever they're going through, um, you got to be careful. You know, if they say, well, do you want to know everything I've done? You say, no. No. There's no need. You know it's sin, right? If it's sin, you've got to stop. And that's because it's disgraceful to speak of the things which are done by them in what? In secret. What do you do? You bring the scripture to light on, on that situation. Look at verse 13. All things become visible when they are exposed by the light. Meaning, instead of exposing the sin, you guys see that? It's, well, instead of talking about that sin action and going into all the details, simply expose it with the light. Meaning, call it what the Bible calls it. For everything that becomes visible is what? Is light. Okay? All things become visible as biblical principles, and that's the implication. Uh, the word light is a reference to scripture, like in Proverbs 6.23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. And when you expose that deed with the scripture, you've made it clear now. Okay, You've exposed it and that's what he's saying to do. So he's not saying don't talk. He's saying don't talk in detail about it when it's just too perverse. There's no need to go into like, oh, they did this and this and this and that. Just they've sinned. So, a new attitude, a new attitude of love, of purity, separation, okay? Separate in adoption, character, purpose, and activity. Now, fourthly, and this is last for today, an attitude of submission. Submission, and there's two things to submit to here. And one's very, both are really interesting, but the second one I think is way more convicting because all of us have problems with this. The first one in verse 14 <clears throat> is a submission of faith. And second, verse 15, the submission of your time. <gasps> time. And we can talk about this for weeks on end and get very philosophical. MacArthur in his commentary mentions this statue. I forgot the name of it. But in the front, it looks like a regular person with a lock of hair, you know, things like that. But when you walk behind the statue, it's like it's bold, like there's nothing, you know. And he's saying, and, he re and that man represents time. You see time coming, you see the face and the hair. But the moment you let him pass by, time has what? Passed, and there's nothing there, there's no more hair, he's already grown old, time is gone. Okay? Every one of us has a set time. Anyways, let's take a look at the first one, verse 14. Did you know that faith is an act of submission? Okay? As Christians, to walk worthy, we need to be submissive. Okay? 
Like for instance, if you look at verse 21, notice what it says here. Be submissive to one another. Do you guys see that? Look at verse 22. Wives, be submissive to your own what? Husbands. First 21, verse 21 says, everybody in the church, male and female, were all to be very submissive. You know, you don't want me to do that? Hey, I won't do that. You want me to do this? I'll do that. You want me to go there? I'll go there. There's a submissive attitude in our heart. We don't, we don't resist. And then it says, women be submissive to your husband. Everything is about submission. And did you know that believing in God is submitting? You know when people say things like, hey, trust in God, I'm trying. I know you don't have any money, you don't have a job, you have nothing. Trust in God. Oh, it's hard to trust in Him. Look, you have to obey. You have to obey and stop doubting. You have to obey and simply what? Trust. I'm trying. No, stop. You're not hearing me. Obeying, submitting is not trying. It's doing it. Just trust in Him. Look at verse... Um, um, verse 14 for this reason it says awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you now commentators believe that this was a verse from a song that they used to sing it was like a hymnal that they used to sing in the church and Paul is quoting it and for a brief moment as he's going through the instruction to the church he knows that there are certain unbelievers sitting in the church. And notice what he's saying here. He's, he's now declaring to them, Awake! Sleeper! What is he saying? He's saying, Repent! Start believing! He's saying, Believe! Rise from the dead! Wake up! It's like, how do you tell a dead person to wake up? Well, you can't. But you still call him. Like when we go evangelizing, what are we ultimately doing? We're telling a person who's dead in sin to what? Repent. We're saying, wake up. Even though they can't what? Wake up. But when we command them, if the Spirit of God is in them, they will actually what? Respond in obedience. The two commands is awake and arise. There are two imperatives. Awake and arise. That means believe. So did you know that when a person becomes a Christian and he begins to believe, that is really his first act of obedience? Baptism is a public portrayal of his obedience, but believing is the first submission of a sinner. Did you know that? Isn't that interesting? And we have to keep on what? Believing. Do you guys understand? We began our life by believing, we're submitting to God and believing in Christ. We're continuing to believe and trust. Faith is a submission to God. The ability to exert faith is, yes, a gift from God, but nonetheless, we have to obey and submit by believing. But secondly, we have to submit our time. Now, I'll, I'll admit, okay, I try my best with my time, but... I'm, I feel miserably at this. And so preaching on this is like really convicting. This is for all of us. Look what verse 15 says. Therefore, look carefully how you walk. Not as fools, but as wise. Different translation says, look carefully, ESV, how you walk. The legacy standard version, look carefully. King James Version, Ye walk circumspectly, meaning walk and look around. Be aware. NASB, be careful how you walk. NIV, be careful. NLT, be careful. So there's look carefully, walk circumspectly, be careful how you walk. All of those are, are what this word is saying. But if you want to stay literal, the Greek word for uh, all of this is literally um, it's the word blepate means look. It, it literally means with your eyes, look. Pay attention to your life. Place close attention to how you're walking. Stop wasting time. That's what he's saying. Wasting time is a sin. 
Did you know that? Wasting time is a sin. Okay? Paul is saying, be wise. Don't be a fool, meaning be skillful in the way you live. Maximize that time. Be a skillful time user, time manager. And verse 16 says, redeeming the time. Redeeming. What does that mean? It literally means to buy up. And, and, and it's weird because you can't really buy time, right? Because time just keeps on passing by. And, and what, and, and what, okay, here, let me, let me just read this to you uh, from, the, from MacArthur's commentary. Exagorazzo, that's the word that's being used here, um, has the basic meaning of buying, especially of buying back or buying out. It was used of buying a slave in order to set him free. Thus, the idea of redemption is applied in this verse. We are to redeem, buy up all the time that we have and devote it to the Lord. The Greek word is in the middle voice, indicating that we are to buy the time up for ourselves, for our own use, but in the Lord's service. And Paul, in this verse, and I quote, pleads for us to make the most of our time immediately after he pleads for us to walk wisely rather than foolishly. Meaning, outside of purposeful, outside of purposeful disobedience of God's word, listen carefully, the most spiritually foolish thing a Christian can do is to waste time and opportunity to fritter away his life in trivia and in half-hearted service of the Lord. Let me continue to quote. The great 16th century reformer Philip Melanchthon kept a record of every wasted moment took that list to God in confession at the end of the day. You know, I think if we did that, we would literally pray for hours. Well, we'll end up wasting more what? Hours. Isn't that interesting? Three hours of wasted time, confessing three hours that we wasted. Now we wasted six what? The Bible warns, MacArthur continues, about time. Time is limited. Noah, right? They said 120 years and that's it. The five foolish virgins in Matthew 25, they, time came and they weren't ready. The word time here is not chronos, like chronological. It's kairos. It's an epic. Meaning, God has given you this amount. God has given you this amount. <laughs> what are you doing? He's all given us different amount of what? Time. Now, I do have to say this because some of you will smirk at me and say, no matter how much you exercise, you're still going to die at the right time. You're limited. But you will definitely live better. Okay? okay? You won't be, you know, maybe more energetic, but you have an epic of time allotted to you. It doesn't matter what you do, it's going to come to an end one day. It might be tonight. It might be tomorrow. It might be 30 years later. But every one of us has a, an allotment and we can't go back and refill it again. Paul says here the days are evil. And I think it's pretty obvious what that means. The days are evil. The world is decaying in sin. And what are we doing as the days are evil? That's why I told you guys, the most significant thing we can do as a believer, aside from going to church and coming together in fellowship and worship of God, is what? Evangelism. If the days are evil and people are wasting away in their life, going to them with the gospel is the most best use of the time that God has given to us. And when we go to UCLA and we stay there from 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock after dinner, it is the most 
amazing use of time. Think about it. Out of Monday through f- s- Sunday, right? We literally did just that. Now, granted, if that was literally the only thing we could do, we would, but we have to work. We have to spend time with our children, play with them. We also have to rest at times because our body just can't go on, on, and on. So there's an appropriate time to what? Rest and have leisure. So we're not discounting that. Do you guys understand? Vacation, recreation, even exercise, time to just take a break. But the idea is you have to submit your time to God and be better at organizing it because more often than not, we're wasting it. Or we're simply selfishly idolizing time. Do you remember what greed was related to? Greed, which is idolatry. You guys remember that? Okay. And I will say this. Some of you are greedy with your time. It's become an idol. You want that time for your what? Your gain, yourself, your luxury, your pleasure. And you are angry when that is intruded upon. You know, you plan to do something and your kid gets sick. Oh, now I can't go. You just displayed idolatrous greed there. This is my time. And you get upset when someone does something and takes that away. Guys, it's not your time. Do you understand? God has granted you time. God has granted you an hour here. Do you guys understand that? You were given this time. You know, when I was growing up, uh, we learned to pray every time. Thank you for the day. And then after a while, it just became like a habit as we pray, Lord, thank you for today. And then as I grew, that word became much more special because he literally gave us what? That day. And I think it's appropriate to say that, to recognize again and again, time has been granted and we must look carefully how we walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time. With whatever time we have left, we're going to... Buy it up and devote it to to the Lord's work. That we don't waste time anymore. And again, going back to verse um, 10. What are we all trying to do now? Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you so much for giving us this moment to learn, to be instructed, to be made aware of our faults and our sin. We thank you for guiding us here, giving us life. And Father, we turn to you in shame and with embarrassment that we have wasted so much of your gift to us. But Father, we with humble with brokenness and with repentance, desire to commit time to you, to be submissive to you in our faith, to be separate from this world, to make it a goal to learn to be pleasing to you. Father, would you help us and give us wisdom? We ask for your strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand together.